Rory Stewart. Now, even your critics would say, until now, you've electrified this contest. Tonight, you were a bit lacklustre, weren't you? And you're right. I didn't find that format really worked for me. And I'm going to have to learn how I, I flourish in a strange format of alternative reality. Now, do you think you can carry on, go through to the next stage on your own, or do you need to put your arm around one of the other candidates and say, can we have a dream ticket? I definitely think that we would all be in a stronger position if we could begin to combine. The problem, of course, that you're dealing with is that with politicians, every single person thinks that they should be the leader. So the challenge in all these conversations is who's coming in behind who? And anyone you think you could combine with? I like very much, uh, I've, I've said that I wouldn't serve in a Boris government, but I, I like the other candidates very much and I would be making open offers to all of them. Open offers to be their deputy or to be the top person on the ticket? There, of course, you've put your finger on the problem, Nick. Uh, I would be hoping to be the leader. Michael Gove, you were taking the fight to Rory Stewart. Are you rattled by the outsider? Uh, no, I won the debate, Nick. And you I, won the debate? Yeah, course, uh, Tell I, us how scientific this is, that you uh, won the debate. Because I had the most detailed answers and I have a clear plan for how we can deliver Brexit and make sure that we uh, get all the benefits of life outside the European Union. And, of course, there are some other great people there. I love Rory, I love Boris, uh, Saj and Jeremy. They will all be fantastic members of my team. But back at Westminster, you don't have much momentum, do you? I'm, I'm against momentum, Nick. Sajid Javid, punchy performance. Yeah, I was very happy uh, with that, and it's a great format, and it's excellent to be up there with my colleagues who are making my case. You started in last place tonight, uh, but you sort of took the fight to your colleagues? Well, look, these leadership elections, they're very unpredictable. There's all to play for, and I'm very confident that my message will be heard and that, that I've got a very good chance in this. But as I said tonight, in the last thing I said, whatever happens, it's really important that we all unite behind the eventual winner. And you got the other candidates to agree to this inquiry into Islamophobia in your part? This shows you it's leadership. See, already, you know, get them to agree to things. Isn't that great news? And you knew the name of Abdullah from Bristol. Boris Johnson didn't. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we all forgot some names during the whole evening. Thank you and very much. Are you, the bomb, are you now the Dom Raab candidate out by the 31st of October, deal or no deal? I am one of the key candidates in this, and I'm sure that many more people will be listening to my message in the days to come. Sajid Javid, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, Margaret Thatcher, famously the lady was not for turning, but Boris is the candidate for backing down. He said to the ERG, got their vote saying we leave on the 31st of October, deal or no deal. He's now merely saying that's eminently feasible. Well, he was saying that it is eminently feasible to leave with a deal on the 31st of October. He's very clear on his Brexit position. He's been clear in public and in private, leaving on the 31st of October. Now, my strong preference is that we leave with a deal on the 31st of October, and I think Boris is best placed to do that, and that's one of the reasons that I'm backing him. Matt Hancock, thanks very much. What now, Nick? Well, horse trading uh, for tomorrow. And interestingly, we're seeing the contours of the battle for second place. Two takeouts from the candidates with momentum, but who are in fourth and fifth place. Rory Stewart saying we have to have joint tickets. Mm. He wants to be the top, top dog. And Sajid David clearly going for those very Brexity votes uh, of Dom Robs. Mm. 30 votes there saying we're out, deal or no deal, 31st of October. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to the Work and Pension Secretary, Amber Rudd, who's backing Jeremy Hunt. I start by asking her whether she was disappointed that he only got three more votes than on the first ballot. The important thing for us was that Jeremy maintained his lead and came second, and he did that. But what I thought happened tonight in the debates is that he clearly outperformed the others. He got some personal endorsements from members of the public who are participating in the questions. So I'm confident that he'll, bu he'll build on that for the further votes tomorrow and on Thursday. Don't you worry about that lack of momentum, though? All the momentum is now with Rory Stewart, who put on those huge gains in MP numbers. But I, I think that tonight we saw a candidate who was really coming through in Jeremy. And listen, everybody wants their candidates to do better at every vote. But I do feel that as a result of tonight, he was able to show that he's getting the right balance, really, between being frank about the economic challenge and wanting to deliver on Brexit. And I thought that his personal stories about the farmer in Shropshire and one or two others would really ring home with people. So I think he'll really make some gains tomorrow. He was the one person who said that he would reverse some of those cuts to social care and mental care. Yes. 
I mean, the point is, we're, we're going to be choosing a new lead of the Conservative Party and a new Prime Minister. And people want to know, of course, how they can deliver on Brexit and what care they're going to take on the economy as they do that. But quite rightly, people want to know what else is in there. What, what, what are the plans for the future? And I thought he spoke very frankly about that. But he was the health secretary. Indeed he was. <laughs> and so, so he got things wrong. And so it was a brave thing to say, to say we know that people want this addressed. And I think it, they do. We have a, a green paper on social care coming through shortly, but it has been delayed a long time. We need to get on with it. And he's right to highlight that. There is talk tonight, as you will know, of a potential pact or conversations or whatever you want to call them between Michael Gove and Rory Stewart. Well, I, actually, I haven't heard that, but there are, of course, a lot of talks about people doing pack, pacts, MPs lending votes, and personally, I think all that is rubbish. Do you think Boris Johnson lent votes I to do Jeremy not. Hunt? I do not. And anyway, that's such an arrogant approach to choosing a leader and a prime minister. I would expect and hope that every MP will vote for whoever they think is going to be the best prime minister for this country. But you know that Boris Johnson wants the second to be Jeremy Hunt. That's I do not know that. I do not. I, I absolutely do not know that. And I would say, if anybody's thinking that, uh, bring it on. I'd be delighted, of course, to see Jeremy as the second candidate here, going face to face and head to head with Boris Johnson. Um, all, all that gaming, it has unintended consequences in different places. So I would urge my fellow MPs to really just vote for whoever they think is the best candidate. Is there anything that watching Jeremy Hunt you wish he'd done differently tonight? No, I, I thought he did really well. And I thought that Oxford man spoke for the nation when he said that Jeremy Hunt was the best candidate. Well, on one question. On one on question. Taxes. Well, he was the only one who got that sort of endorsement, so I'll, I'll bank that. And when you were watching as a, a group of Conservative men um, who quite often were fighting for the ground and talking over each other and all the rest of it, I wonder what it made you feel as a really senior... Female in the Yes, cabinet. I long to see uh, more women competing for the leadership in the Conservative Party. We've just had a woman Prime Minister, so there's no shortage of other senior women who will be coming through. But you're right, I would like to see always more women competing at this level. Do you think Jeremy Hunt will make the final two? I do, yes. After tonight's performance, I'm pretty certain he will. Amber Rudd, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to say all the campaign teams for the remaining candidates have put forward their <coughs> representatives to speak to us. And it was all men for the debate earlier. Uh, you can see it is men again tonight, but we're joined uh, by the Conservative Party leader Ian Duncan-Smith for Boris Johnson, former Work and Pension Secretary Stephen Crabbe for Sajid Javid, the former Minister George Eustace for Michael Gove and the Justice Secretary David Gork for Rory Stewart. Um, all I'm going to ask you don't talk over each other because we've had enough of that for a moment. Um, let me start with Ian Duncan-Smith. Mm. There wasn't a commitment, at least I didn't hear a commitment, to October the 31st from Boris Johnson. He talked about it being eminently feasible without ever committing. Well, I don't agree, and I didn't agree with Nick on that too. I thought it was clear in the whole way through. What he said was, we have to leave on the 31st of October, full stop. That's what he said. And then he goes on to say it's eminently achievable, i.e. getting this sorted out, getting all the plans ready for the 31st is absolutely right. So you're and that's happy. what he said. You're happy. I am more than going, happy. You're I going thought, to leave you on the 31st. I thought on that that was a very strong commitment. We are leaving on the 31st of October. The key question is, will the EU want to do an arrangement with us that allows us to leave on the 31st on a... Article 24.5b, which means zero tariffs and regulatory equivalents while you negotiate the trade deal. Mm. That's a much simpler process the than going back, trying to withdraw, re uh, renegotiate the withdrawal agreement, which is dead now and shouldn't be raised. <laughs> well, we know there are complications to that, but there are a couple of other mm -hmm. holes as well. In life, full stop. Of course, and there were key policy announcements that he had mm. uh, announced via column, let's say. The tax, the tax one sounds like tonight it was watered down to an ambition. Well, I think actually what he was talking about was a debate about tax and tax reduction. And he talked about his particular policy, which was that those people who have been sucked in over now the better part of 15 years into the upper rate tax band, many of them at the bottom end of that are simply people doing uh, really important work, but they're not leading companies, they're not running hospitals, they're the middle management, which is required A lot of people up here, for. a lot of members of your party... So I think it's quite reasonable, they're, they're like losing it. money. It, it sounded like it had been watered down because it was proving unpopular no, already. It isn't unpopular, and I'm absolutely You're, clear... You think he'll stick to it? I think tax reform is critical to whoever gets elected as leader. What we have managed to do is bank ourselves into the Gordon Brown message on this, which is that they 
we don't realise any longer that tax is a net positive. It actually produces more income, it incentivises more people to work harder, and it therefore does better for uh, Britain. And he could have said that. He could have said that. Well, he said, he said we should have that debate mm -hmm. about taxation because Conservatives want to have tax But that was the first time we heard from him. Wouldn't you have liked him to say, yes, here's a policy and I'm proud of it and yeah. here's why? Well, OK, he'll say it next time. But he, said, he, he said on this one, I thought it was clear, we are going to do that on tax. We're going to reduce the level of taxation where we do that across the board is a debate that I think is necessary for the Conservative it, Party it, to have, it, but I think the, it's a positive debate. The, the problem that Boris Johnson's mm -hmm. got is that his Brexit is promising to deliver to the EU27 and the DUP and the ERG, all wings of your party, Estimate Vane, Matt Hancock. Mm. He's the chameleon candidate. He is whatever he sits on. Not really. I think that if you looked at what he said and what I believe absolutely categorically we need to deliver is, number one, we have to commit to leaving by October the 31st. He's done that. Two, you can't renegotiate the withdrawal agreement. You'd insult the intelligence of the EU. You, you know he's not going to please no, 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 and the EU 27. I'm sorry, I have talked to Matt Hancock. I've talked to the others. It's very clear to them that this is what Boris is saying. And there is an arrangement you can make with the EU, which is not a complicated withdrawal agreement, which some of my colleagues think is doable. It's not. But it is an arrangement that says we're going back to your original offer for free trade. And by the way... Uh, he was quite clear in there when he talked about alternative arrangements on the border of Ireland. It's worth reminding ourselves that Mr Varadka and Barnier have both said categorically in terms that if there was no arrangement, there would still be no hard border. Why? Because they've well, agreed they've there will also, be alternative they've also arrangements. They've ruled out any deal that doesn't have the backstop no, in I'm it. sorry, that's not true. Well, that's what he said no, this weekend. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, have to, I okay. saw Monsieur Barnier. He was quite that clear was about this. That was Varadkar this weekend. No, it doesn't matter. Varadkar and Barnier have both said you would not have a hard border in any circumstances and you they would use alternative deal. arrangements. That's right. what they've said, okay. I promise let's, you. Let's don't go to David Gort because Rory Stewart's problem tonight, he kept on talking about the irreality of the thing. I don't know if he meant the set or the, um, the way he was sitting or, or the conversation in the room particularly, but he admitted that he was quite lacklustre, or he agreed with Nick Watt, let's say. I thought he was being a bit harsh on himself there. I don't think, you know, to be fair, Sunday evening was a very clear win for, for Rory. He was head and shoulders above the other candidates. I think the format tonight didn't necessarily appeal to his, his strength because he's very good with a studio audience, but I thought that Rory still won the debate because he was the one that was facing up to the hard choices that we have. He wasn't promising things that were undeliverable. He was facing up to the fact that we don't have billions of pounds that we can throw around for tax cuts. We, if we're going to leave the European Union, we've got to get Parliament to support that. Uh, it's no good threatening no deal if Parliament <clears throat> is going to block it, unless you're going to ignore Parliament. And nobody said that they so were going to do that. So why is he looking for, for a, couple, a sort of conscious coupling, let's say, then? Why is he looking for a partner in this now, then? Well, I think he's making the case that he wants... Uh, one of the other candidates to come in, Who? row in and support? Well, I think he would accept the support from any of them. I, I, Who's he I don't talking to? Say, well, I don't know if there's sort of great discussions on these things, yes, but the fact do. is... Come on. Yes, the you fact, you're in his no, no, Well, the, the fact is that Rory Stewart is the candidate with the momentum. I mean, the big story today is that Rory almost doubled his support in the elections. He's moved from seventh to fifth place. He's climbing up the table. Isn't that the he's winning that over support from other candidates when everything now. else is, is, is installing. He's, he's become a player. He's a key player. And he's he's lost that kind of who's the new kid. Well he's he he is clearly a serious, credible candidate. He's therefore a target from the other campaigns, which we saw today, you know, uh, sort of an attempt to sort of suggest that it was a terrible thing. He might have been an MI6 agent was the sort of headline in the Daily Telegraph, which was ridiculous. Um, he is he is a threat and therefore he's going to attract the attention of the other campaigns. And, and but he's, look, he's had a very good day he's today. He's also finding it difficult at this stage to work out what is statesmanlike and what is private. He condemned privately on Twitter uh, the tweet of President Trump, but yet he didn't he didn't think he would do that if he was Prime Minister. Well, Trump I think the point, I mean, to, to be fair, this was one of those occasions where uh, he got shouted over and so on. He, look, he's condemned the tweet from uh, President Trump. I think the point he was simply making was that when you are Prime Minister and every Prime Minister in this position finds themselves uh, having to reflect the fact you do have to be diplomatic. But, look, he's condemned the, the London Star uh, tweet from, from President Trump. OK. George Eustace, um, you're backing Michael Gove. You've had a week to target more votes. And you only got four tonight. Was that a disappointment? 
Uh, no, we've moved forward and always in this contest as it progresses, the key thing is that you keep moving forward, keep adding support. Crucially, we're still um, within touching distance of Jeremy Hunt, who's in second place. But I think with uh, far more potential to pick up support from the candidates that remain uh, behind us. And so uh, we've got two crucial days now as this vote goes on. I think uh, Michael Gove did a, a very powerful performance tonight, um, full of conviction, uh, a master of detail, very assured performance. And I think he's in a very strong position as we go into the votes he's, tomorrow. He seems to have relinquished his place amongst those left as the, the primary sort of Brexiteer to take on Boris Johnson. Savage Javid gave much clearer, clearer answers on the leaving date than Gove did. did well, I think the most important you? thing is to be consistent. And Michael Gove has been consistent about resetting our relationship with Europe since he was a student. Uh, I campaigned with him against the euro some 15 years ago. He led the campaign uh, against uh, uh, the EU, led the campaign uh, to leave, and uh, today remains uh, the only other Brexiteer other than Boris Johnson uh, in this contest. I think in the case of Sajid, what you've had is somebody who uh, has maybe tacked some way, uh, just as Boris has tacked away from the October we'll, we'll date come and to the said in it's a, a uh, uh, just, let, now, just now a sort of a feasible uh, option. Um, I think we've seen Sajid try to tack towards that. And I think people should ask themselves, who's been consistent on this right through? And that's Michael Gove. And, and could you rule out a pact with Rory Stewart? Yes. Um, Rory has been pushing this around, but it's um, a bonkers idea. I've told him that. Uh, in Conservative leadership campaigns, and I've seen a few, when a candidate's eliminated, uh, their supporters go all over the place. They yeah. scatter like cats. The idea that you can have some... But it might be that or nothing. I mean, it might be Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt and, and your... Well, then we must let then. this contest progress and see who's left standing. Yeah. You don't do sort of bizarre packs, as uh, Rory's been suggesting. Let's get on to this tacking, Stephen Crabb, because there was this odd moment where Sajid Javid suddenly emerged as the only one on that panel who said definitely that they would leave by October the 31st. It was almost like Dominic Raab had fallen out of the contest and he was almost going for his votes next. Well, not quite like that, but let me, it's interesting that George singles out Sajid Javid for attack there. So it's obviously that their campaign, the Gove campaign, is, is rattled by Sajid Javid. He's changed his a, a, a sense that Gove's campaign is perhaps running out of steam. Now, what you had from Sajid Javid tonight was a, a really clear... Uh, presentation of his character, his values, his personality, and all of those are incredibly attractive things. And the more that people see and hear of Sajid Javid, the more that they like. And you know what was interesting? I lost count of the number of times the other candidates who sat here said, I agree with Sajid Javid, which shows that leadership, it also shows he is Maybe the man to, to unite it. a deeply divided party. You don't think they're just kind of saying goodbye in a gracious way because they think well, he won't last 24 hours? No. And did, well, didn't Sajid Javid look like a man who's about to throw in the <laughs> towel or about to be knocked out of the contest, contest? He fought tonight. I thought he gave a very... In a difficult format, he gave a very, very good display of what he can offer the country and the party. Let me ask you, did you, did you get a text from Roy Stewart's team asking for your support? I did. <laughs> and it was identical to some number of the ones that have appeared on social Did media. Did they praise today. your intellect? It didn't praise my intellect, funnily enough. It made other compliments, but not my intellect. And how many of these went out? Do you know? I have no you, idea. Perhaps you should ask, uh, ask text, David Gork here, who's part of the Rory Stewart campaign. Th this is interesting. <laughs> I didn't get one. <laughs> <didn't get> <laughs> well, there's a surprise. Not one from everybody else, but, but not from him. But what's interesting <laughs> is in the wider picture, the wider electoral picture, Matthew Goodwin, who uh, writes extensively about populism, as you know, his latest report has said that the Conservatives are now losing to the Lib Dems, not to the Brexit party. So th this is all for nothing, isn't it? Sajid Javid sort of moving towards his hard Brexit and his October the 31st. If that's where you're losing votes, then... Well, Sajid is a negotiator. He knows how to do deals. He spent his career doing that. So he knows the importance of a hard deadline. The point that he made in tonight's debate was exactly right. You need a resolution to this matter. So there's no point treating this 31st of October deadline as some flaky, movable uh, thing that, that, that will just keep on testing the patience of the British public. So he's right on that point. The other point I'd make is that this contest is about far more than Brexit. And if the Conservative Party genuinely wants to turn the page, start a fresh conversation with the mm. country, reach communities who, frankly, haven't been giving us a look in recent elections, mm. Sajid is the man to do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that he achieved um, was this independent investigation to Islamophobia with whichever is the next mm. Prime Minister. Are you confident that will happen? Do you think that will go ahead? Well, I, 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 they all committed to it, so I'm assuming that they'll all decide to go ahead and whoever ends up in top, I hope Boris does. I'm sure Boris will commit to that as well, which he did tonight. I personally do not believe there is a problem of Islamophobia inside the Conservative Party. 
Uh, but I'm very happy... I couldn't even remember the name of the imam who'd asked me Well, actually, question. he got it right first time. And, you know, with all honesty, if you weren't being prompted, just how many names would you get right? So let's not get to the position of exactly how often you remember names. It's the key point, is how do you deal with the question? The truth is, Boris's article that he wrote, by the way, which is really important, he went out of his way to justify defending the freedom of people in Britain to do and wear what they like. It was about the time when Denmark banned the hijab. And, was that and that the right was exactly the point. Yes, because what he was that pointing... Was the right way to do I think it. the way he was pointing it out was to say, look, no matter what you think about it, it is their right to wear it, and that is the right that you defend. And I think that's absolutely right, and, and that's gone missing. Michael Gove made a good point in the debate as well, though. You know, we've got <coughs> Labour with their own problems with anti-Semitism. Yeah. We should be holding them to account on that, uh, not just, you know, navel-gazing over it, allegations. What was interesting, problems. just to go back to Stephen's mm. point, which is about, the, you know, the fresh look of whatever happens next. When you went back um, to members of the audience and there mm. were Conservative voters and there were people who had left mm. the Conservatives' vote breaks and all the rest of it, they weren't that impressed with what they were seeing. I mean, there were, there were no commitments, no new commitments on climate change. There yeah. weren't people who felt that they'd been answered. There was a sense constantly mm. that they hadn't, they hadn't <clears> quite... <throat> well, I would hadn't rather quite made, made contact with the electorate. I would have agreed with the audience in one sense, that I do think these kind of debates with this many people never really quite works because there's too many people trying to get in, too many interruptions. I think, actually, when this gets down to two people, that's when you get to a serious debate about where policy lies, because each is challenging the other. But when you've got four or five people, yeah, all I, you've got I, is I, a bit I of a mess. I completely agree with Ian. I think that's right. And, and you need to narrow it down. Now, I have to say that we need to have a <clears throat> robust debate over the weeks ahead. Yep. Uh, I do think, you know, we've got a clear front runner, but I think it would be fair to say that we weren't getting clear answers from that front runner right. tonight. And what we need is a candidate who will be robust, who will tell the truth and make the case. And I do believe that this is where Rory has a big advantage because, look, he's not looking to go through the motions. He's not looking to lose gracefully and end up as Foreign Secretary or Chancellor. He wants a tough, I, tough I, case I, jump, I jumped in, and, yeah. and perhaps that's unfair. But Boris Johnson does seem to have a real problem with just answering a question directly. You know, whatever the question. Well, I don't know that that's he the case. He didn't answer any of the ones in his press conference. You know, there were six different people. Well, he answered, he answered six questions, which were all the same. And so by the time you get to the sixth question, and they're all asking exactly the same question, you ask yourself, what's the point? Because you've got a bunch of journalists, first Pete, then repeat. And I have to tell you, that's fine. I'm a full defender. Well, there. they were all the same. Come on, they were all about one issue. My point here is that he answers questions, but not everybody does it Very in the same way. Not everybody does God, it in the same but way. This just you underlines the, the point that we need a really, really tough and robust leadership contest. This isn't just about an internal circus that we're having in the Conservative Party. This is to pick a Prime Minister for the whole United Kingdom. Right. And letting somebody romp home to the end, be the, uh, the, the winner, without really coming under intense scrutiny, I think would be a mistake. We made that we're, going to, right. we're, yeah. we're pulling out now. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>